here we are in Liberdade, one of the most famous districts in Sao Paulo. This is the oriental area in Brazil. In my quest to find the Japanese influence on Brazil, I'm with Marissa, a Nikkei, that's someone of Japanese origin who lives elsewhere. Lipidage retains its Japanese character. By the 1930s, some 2,000 Japanese had settled in the city. In these streets, Nearly every building was then a Japanese home or business. Not far away from the busy streets, we find a deserted park, and in it, a memorial to a pioneer. Shuhei Utseka arrived with the first Japanese migrants in 1908, and later, helped to set up settlements in what was then little more than jungle. Still in Liberdade, we learn more about the story of that migration. The museum has an interactive section, so Marissa learns more about our own family history. That's my father. It's surprising, he left Japan on his 12th birthday. Next, she searches for her mother. She arrived in uh, December the 30th, 1929. She, they came with the Buenos Aires Maru. My grandfather, my grandmother, my mother's sister, uh, my mother. Marissa's mother and father were two of more than 200,000 Japanese who made this long boat journey to Brazil. We meet another, Professor Uhala. Como o mundo estava passando dificuldade após a crise de 29 lá da, dos americanos e do mundo e o mundo todo teve dificuldade e o Japão também então desses é, oito irmãos na verdade seis viemos para o Brasil fomos até Ribeirão Preto de lá de ônibus fomos para numa fazenda de café dos, das famílias Junqueira essa gruta uhum. é, e assim, né? deveria ficar lá uns dois anos, ficar junto com a família da minha tia e trabalhar na fazenda de café. Like the very first migrants, Professor Uhara's family came to work in coffee plantations. By the 19th century, Brazil produced half the world's coffee. They are cleaning the coffee fields. Okay. You can see even children working. Sao Paulo State subsidized the first migrants, but only for family groups. Most migrants, like this Nikkei's family, worked in agriculture. A parte do meu pai realmente veio para a parte agrícola. Eles acabaram se estabelecendo até hoje são cafeicultores é, no interior de Minas. Mas assim. Eles vieram para cá realmente assim, como uma oferta de, um, de uma vida melhor. Então eles passaram por toda a dificuldade da linguagem, né, da língua, da alimentação.
Although most migrants went to Sao Paulo, with its huge demand for agricultural labour, some went north. When I was a child, I used to uh, hear about Tomiyasu, that Japanese came here and uh, planted uh, pepper, black pepper, and they were successful. But success in this remote region took time. We meet Mr Yamada, the last survivor of the very first group to settle here. <laughs> Foi bem. Uhum. Eu vim com dois anos de idade, em 1920, nove, chegamos aqui em Tomeaçu, no tempo era Cará. Chegamos aqui no dia 22 de setembro de 29, uhum. com meus pais. Certo. Nós éramos apenas quatro pessoas, pai, mãe, e uma irmã e eu. Uhum. Em 88 anos foi muita dificuldade, muita alegria, muita tristeza para alcançar. Então, logo no início do trabalho aqui, realmente, a gente sofremos bastante, principalmente com a doença. A malária era demais. And we meet Dr. Homer, who has studied Japanese migration in the Amazon area. Eu nasci em Parintins, no estado da Amazônia. Então, a minha família foram imigrantes que vieram, exatamente, quer dizer, que nós tivemos dois núcleos de entrada de imigrantes japoneses na Amazônia. Na verdade, que rendia muito pouco, assim, né? Então, dizer, os japoneses, então, dizer que naquela época tinha uma escassez de mão de obra muito grande. Tá? E com a guerra, então, também desmantelou esse modelo japonês que tinha lá em Parintins. Né? Uhum. Muitos japoneses, assim, que a liderança, assim, foram, dizer, que foram considerados, nós chamávamos a quinta coluna. Né? E meu pai ficou também seis meses preso. Né? And at this cultural association, we learn more about how Japanese colonies came to the Amazon. Japanese, German and Italians uh, resident in Pará were in the concentration camp. To study with this book when I was a child in the Japanese school, the legend says that uh, if you make 1,000 of them, your dream will come true. Back in 1940s Sao Paulo, Marissa's parents were hoping to make their dreams come true and were raising a family. I was born on this street and probably I used to live in one of these houses. And uh, my parents moved here from the countryside because uh, they thought life in the city would be better. We are in Pinheiros and this is where I grew up. I spent all my childhood in this area and this is the uh, place where I used to live. I used to live down there and come to this uh, Japanese school. The school was up And after here. Japanese school in the morning, Marissa came here. Uh, this is Alfredo Bressa, the school where I used to come in the afternoon, where I had learned everything in Portuguese. For Japanese communities, education was always important, but not always easy. Aí no ano seguinte, já com 10 anos, eu recomecei. Eu ia até na, na vila chamada. Hoje é um município, um município de 12 mil pessoas, não sei. Andava quatro quilômetros no meio do mato e às vezes pasto de criação de bezerro. Então tinha que atravessar o pasto com bambu comprido. Sim, para espantar os... as vacas. Então o esforço de toda a família japonesa é botar o filho na escola, E para mim também não foi, não foi fácil dizer para fazer público. Então aí hoje você encontra aqui é, dizer, que é advogado, médico, dizer, que é, é, engenheiro, qualquer profissão liberal, aí você encontra é, descendentes japoneses. Aí, sabe? Então é, o que está acontecendo hoje dizer, que é o desaparecimento dessa, dos Nisseis aqui, no, aqui tanto a gente fica falando, nós comemoramos 100 anos de imigração em 2008. Né? 
another way Marissa's family sought to integrate was through religion. One of the aspects that uh, my parents believed is that uh, we would uh, integrate in the society better was to be Catholic. So that's why we used to come to this church, which is uh, over there. I had my first communion and uh, I used to come every Sunday. Yeah, this is called the Potato Square or Largo da Batata. Uh, potato is, was an important uh, product uh, among uh, the Japanese uh, farmers. Many of them planted the potato and uh, my father was a potato seller. This square was once the headquarters of the Cochia Co-op, once the largest cooperative in South America. Well, the Cooperative Agricola de Cochia ela foi criada justamente por pequenos proprietários que, na verdade, não tinham condições de eh, se manter como, autonomamente. Então, começaram a, a trabalhar juntos não é? Nessa, numa cooperativa que, basicamente, não é? eh, recolhia a produção desses pequenos proprietários não é? e vinha para a cidade de São Paulo comercializar esses, esses produtos. Quer dizer, o primeiro deles foi a batata, não é? e tanto que aqui na, na, na cidade de São Paulo tem o Largo da Batata, que era justamente o local onde os, os, as primeiras carroças e mais tarde os caminhões da cooperativa de Cotia levavam as batatas para serem distribuídas aqui na cidade de São Paulo. Many Japanese farmers made use of co-ops. In North Brazil, we find one that is still operating successfully. Exatamente, isso aí virou uma referência aqui no norte, principalmente aqui na Amazônia, né? E virou uma referência hoje, é, hoje é muito bem tratado pelo governo do estado, né? Politicamente hoje é muito bem, a gente é convidado para estar tá discutindo, reunindo, levando né, esse essa consciência ambiental, né? Que a gente trabalhamos com agroflorestal, né? And we are shown round this thriving business. É, eu tenho certeza que a canta hoje para o município ela é muito importante. Certo. Muito importante que ela gera tanto que eu tinha. É, vocês podem pedir para uma pessoa ali que uma tem uma imagem de tomé de quatro bocas, né? No uh -huh. caso aqui. Certo. Como era antes. Uh -huh. Era a canta esse esse prédio o prédio central esse de três andares uh -huh. e o depósito de madeira. E o restante, toda essa área aqui em volta era a pimenta do reino. Ela está limpa agora. Out of town is the cooperative's factory, where the manager gives us a guided tour. Uh, this storage room uh, is the coldest place in Pará. After experiencing the cold storage, we discover that Camta has many links with Japan. This is a perfume called Tomeasu. It was made by a Japanese singer. He came here and he said that it reminds the smell of this area. Aqui in Tomeasu, né, a gente recebe muitos japoneses do Japão. Eles falam assim, eles até espantam, né? Fica espantado, eles falam, poxa, nem existe mais esse Japão lá, lá no Japão e existe aqui no Brasil. Que por quê? Porque uh, uh, os japoneses vieram há 80 anos para cá, né? Mais, mais novo que está aqui no Brasil, deve ser uns 50 anos atrás que eles veio para cá. Então, a cultura de 50 anos atrás ainda está do mesmo jeito, aí eu... Yeah, this is a huge factory. It's growing a lot. It's incredible what they are achieving. Japanese migrants help to make an important contribution to Brazilian agriculture. Here, 
we see one of the best examples. Cupuaçu, açaí. Açaí. Qual que é o açaí? Esse aqui. Montar para vocês provarem. You can see many different uh, uh, fruit trees and the pepper tree uh, planted in a sustainable way. Everything is reused and uh, they are here today. Many students from Japan, from Tokyo University. But mm -hmm. also we, we are Japanese, so we are very curious how do they sit down in Brazil. Tomeaçu ainda é enraizado muito forte ainda essa parte da cultura dos antigos, né? Sim. Tanto que vem ainda vem gente do Japão, olha, vem, olha aqui, chega assim, ainda vocês fazem isso? É. It was amazing to see that this cooperative is so important for this town. While you, all the, the rest of the Brazil is struggling, very pessimist. The people who work here are very optimistic uh, because they see that uh, this is the future. But Japanese settled in other parts of Brazil. We go in search of another community we've heard about. We are in Bonito, 136 kilometers inland uh, Recife, to check out uh, about uh, a Japanese community. In the late 1950s, Japanese migrants were encouraged to settle in this remote area. Here is a farm uh, owned by a Japanese and he grows everything here you can imagine. We meet the family. <laughs> Eventually, these families found success. Though the future is not so sure. One of the curiosities is that uh, most of these farms are run by old people. Their children are back in Japan. And that's where we head next, to better understand the source of this unique migration. At this museum, we learn about 150 years of migration. Actually, after not the Panama Canal... From this crowded country to many places, including Brazil. Around 25,000 people, including Marissa's parents, left Shikoku Island. We travel across the island, arriving at Kochi. A modern city with one of the few castles that have survived from feudal Japan. From the very start of Japanese migration to Brazil in 1908, this area sent migrants. Nearby is Tosa, 
where the local tourist office is helping us. We are in Tosu City, where my parents came from. And this is Shoko Masui, and she's been very helpful. Thank you. Uh, so, about 1,400 people uh, moved from Tosa City because uh, the life here was really uh, bad. So they had to move to Brazil and then make their living. We're taken to the coastal village of Ni and to the family home of the Maritas. <laughs> Marissa's father lived here until he left for Brazil just before his 12th birthday. This is my grandfather, and in the middle my grandmother, and this is my uncle. After paying respects, it's time to catch up with family news. My father's sister, and she's also my father's sister. These two are my, my father's parents, my uh, grandparents. Why? Oh, we have that too. Oh, that's very famous. That's the symbol of uh, Wales. Also in Ni is the home of Mr. Morisawa, Marissa's cousin and our kind host. Like many generations before him, he has stayed working the land, now running this strawberry farm. <laughs> Still in Tosa, we go to Narukawa. Now we are in Narukawa. My grandmother, my mother's um, mother, used to live up on that hill where there are those white houses. <laughs> where we meet Mr. Katayama. This is the first time Marissa has met him. But he invites us in to see some family photos. His grandparents and Marissa's great grandparents. So, the Wadashino Oyaji Chichioya, Korea, so, hi, Konoga, and Nagna. While Marissa's mother made a new life far away, Mr. Katayama's father was a soldier in the Imperial Japanese Army and never returned from China. Mr. Katayama remained in this village, becoming headmaster at the local school. I didn't know that my f uh, grandfather was the oldest son of the, his family, uh, which is very unusual to uh, immigrate. Usually it's the second or third son who uh, immigrate or who go abroad. We learn more about this place that Marissa's parents left as children nearly 90 years ago. Like much of Japan's heavily populated coastal areas, Ni has been intensively cultivated and until recently completed infrastructure was subject to regular flooding, a further incentive to move away. A Tosa library, staff produce several boxes of documents. This is my father's name. About the city's links with Brazil and with Sao Paulo. He was my doctor when I was a child. Oh, yeah. Oh, and he lived in Pinheiros. He had uh, uh, his office in Teodoro Sampaio. Where my father was born. 
he was born over there and my mom was born over there. This visit to Kochi was very interesting because I got to know a lot about my family background, my mother's side and my father's side. We leave taking the same route as many thousands of migrants who travelled across the island of Shikoku. And arrived at the port of Kobe. Those who left from 1928 stayed at this emigrant centre before leaving. My mother and her family stayed here before going to Brazil and uh, through the exhibition here we could have an idea of uh, what kind of life they had during the trip and also in Brazil. This building was built as if it were a boat, a ship, so that they can start getting used to it from here. A person could carry 45 kilos of baggage, but if they wanted to carry more, they had to pay extra. And exceptionally today, we met many Brazilians preparing some Brazilian food, and also if you need any document, you can come to this place and, be, and they will help you. Then we follow the path to the dock, the route followed by many people from Kochi and elsewhere as they left Japan. Kobe is now a thriving city and port, but in the park near the dock, it remembers those who left for other places in the world. Yeah, it seems that the children enjoyed the ship trip, and mainly when the sea was rough, the old people, the grown-ups, I mean, would uh, be sick and the children would be enjoying the trip. Although leaving for a faraway place, Japanese migrants still kept links with their home country. Here we are at the Japanese pavilion in Sao Paulo. This Japanese pavilion was given to the uh, Japanese Brazilian community in the fourth centenary of uh, the Sao Paulo city. And after 60 years, the pavilion continues to celebrate Japanese traditions. Mas aí, numa viagem que eu fiz para o Japão, né? É, eu fiquei, eu é, cheguei a ver na, na TV, né? O Shamisen. Uh -huh. Aí me interessou, né? Só que no caso eu encontrei o Shamisen aqui no Brasil. Criada pelos meus avós, ah. na verdade, né? Então eu tenho mais. Tem demais aí para o lado japonês, né? Meu pai é Sen, né? Então não tem mais japonês uh -huh. em casa. Minha mãe Sim. também ficou mais do Nihon, né? Do que para o Brasil. Né? Aí minha batia tocava, né? Quando era ela jovem. 
Ah, então, só vou tocar. Tocava, minha mãe tinha tocado. Só que aí, num evento aí eu descobri o grupo, né? I loved the concert. It was very interesting because it was a mixture of traditional songs and modern songs. And some of the songs uh, I heard or I listened when I was a child because my mom used to listen to a Japanese radio program where they had music, news about the community. The music is not the only tradition kept alive today. We are here to talk about uh, Japanese Brazilian literature. This association was founded in 1966, to preserve and the Brazilian literature. In that time, in 1970, no Brasil ainda tinha muitos japoneses que tinham interesse na área de literatura. Bom, é, meu pai foi praticante de haiku e foi discípulo de Nempuku Sato. É, Nempuku Sato foi um grande incentivador do haiku no Brasil e um dos maiores mestres fora do Japão. É a revista da Nikkei Bungaku, chama Brasil Nikkei Bungaku. É, um, é uma revista bilíngue. É, public, public, a revista publicada quadrimestralmente. E nessa parte aqui em português, aqui tem o selo de 50 anos, do ano passado, né? e desse lado em língua japonesa. E nós aprendemos como a cultura japonesa thrive no norte do Brasil. E até dois anos atrás eu estava comandando aqui, né? Como secretário-geral, que fundou em 1958, na época que, depois da Segunda Guerra Mundial, começou a imigração para a japoneses para a região amazônica. Então, esse imigrante espalhou para todas as áreas de região amazônica. Então, o objetivo da atividade daqui também Agora, principalmente, é, é, é difusão de cultura japonesa e como, 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 como... Tem aula de japonês. Aula de japonesa. O que mais? É. Tem de Ikebana. De Ikebana. A... Dança até? Dança também, dança. dança. E tambor. Ah, tambor. E koto, arpa koto. japonesa. Uhum. Today, there are around a million and a half Nikkei in Brazil. They and the migrants that came before them have helped to shape this society, not least by changing agricultural practices. But they too have been influenced. Qualquer imigrante, não importa a origem, não é? ele coloca o pé fora do seu país. E no momento em que ele tem contato com uma outra cultura, com uma outra sociedade, com uma outra realidade, ele deixa de ser aquilo que ele era antes de partir do seu país de origem. The Nikkeis we meet help us to understand how two very different cultures have been brought together through a remarkable migration. E primeira vez para o Japão, porque quando a gente vive aqui, o pessoal chama ele japonês, japonês, né? A gente pensa assim, pô, eu sou mais japonês do que brasileiro. Mas quando eu fui primeira vez para o Japão, eu pensei assim, pô, eu vou agora conhecer a minha terra, né? Aí senti que eu não, sou, não tenho nada a ver com japonês. Aí a primeira vez que eu senti, não, eu sou brasileiro. Eu realmente não sou japonês. Eu, assim, eu me considerava muito brasileira. Mas, ultimamente, eu tenho visto muito meu lado mais oriental. Eu vivi muito na colônia, perto da colônia, e fiquei no internato japonês, inclusive, né? Uhum. Mas, com o tempo, entrando na faculdade, deixei esse lado japonês, né? Eu me considero assim, meio a meio. Porque eu sou brasileiro, mas perante os brasileiros, eu sou japonês. Certo. E perante o japonês, eu sou brasileiro. 